Hello, my name is Laura Bove Godwin, and I'm the director of the Nightlight South Carolina office. And with me also is Rhonda Jarima. She's the director of support services for Nightlight Christian Adoptions. And we're here to talk to you about what's inside the home study. When families are starting the adoption process, the first element is the home study. And often there's lots of questions related to it, things like how long does it take for me to get a home study, what's inside the home study, what are you going to ask me, how much is it going to cost, how long is it good for. And in doing preparation for telling folks about what the home study is all about, we realize there's a lot of information. So we've broken down this webinar into two parts. And today what we're discussing is what's actually inside the home study. In another webinar, we'll discuss the whole process of the home study, which is, can be quite um, interesting and complicated in some ways, and we want to really make it easy for you. So we were going to start exactly what happens inside the home study and what are the contents. And let us go ahead and just tell you a little bit about Nightlight and the services that we provide. Rhonda? Hi. Um, first of all, we, we provide adoption education. Education is very important in the home study process and in the adoption process altogether. Truly, with uh, the, the adoption education, we look at education being about 70% of the whole process, and only about 30% is evaluation and um, checking fingerprints, that sort of thing. Uh, we also are a Hague accredited agency. When the Hague process began a few years ago, Nightlight was one of the agencies that received their accreditation. We provide pre and post placement services because we believe that adoption is a lifelong process and doesn't stop with your adoption. We've been licensed since 1959 and are very proud of the services that we provide to families truly around the world. So to ask what is the big question, what is a home study? And it's basically a document to verify that you qualify to adopt a child. That's why you cannot begin to be matched with a birth mother. That's why we can't start assigning you children from overseas. For example, if you're looking at children with special needs from China on a listserv or from an agency that sent this to you, we do not work with families until they actually have a home study done. And it's just a written document. Usually it's around 10 pages long. And then in addition to that, there are what we call supporting documents, things like your birth certificate, your marriage certificate if you're married, your doctor's letter, letters of reference, criminal records, that sort of thing. And as Rhonda had mentioned, it's not just about coming in with a white glove inspecting your home. After all, it is called a home study. It's not about studying you. It, that is just 30%, and the rest is really education. And we really want to make sure that you are prepared. And again, it's not a scary thing to be educated. It really makes you more comfortable for the whole process. And we even recommend that you start getting educated even before you perhaps start the home study process that you want to start reading. And again, it will make you much more comfortable through the process. And so these are some of the things that we're going to go ahead and ask you within the home study. Rhonda, you want to talk about the family background? Sure. Uh, we want to learn what it was like growing up in your family. What, what was your relationship like with your parents, your siblings? What is it now? Uh, where did you grow up and what values were taught to you? Um, how was your relationship with your parents in terms of discipline? How did they show love to you? Um, how do you celebrate holidays? What kind of celebrations did you have when you were small? What have you brought forth to your family today? And then, of course, this is, the home study can be very positive in the sense that we are trying to find out about you. So it's a great time to tell about your story, your history. And again, we recognize that not everyone has a positive history, but we want to know where you are today. So tell us about your education, your job history, uh, your special interests. And some of these can include hobbies that you may have, such as gardening, boating, reading, chess, sports that you may like. Again, um, 
if you're involved in any of these, and once you have children, you may not be involved so much in this. It may be days more at McDonald's playground. But we do want to know the kind of interests that you do have. Again, it's a way, great way to tell, to kind of fill in the blanks about who you are. We also look at your health. Um, it's important to get a health evaluation to ensure that you are ready to parent, that you are in good physical health and mental health and have no communicable diseases and are capable of parenting a child. These are requirements by our country as well as other countries. And if there is an issue, please do talk to us about it. It doesn't mean that just because you have a health issue that you cannot adopt. We just need to know that whatever is the issue, that number one, that you are capable of parenting a child, and number two, whether or not the other country will accept you. For example, if you're looking at a child with special needs from China, if, for example, a parent were deaf, say, normally China would not allow a deaf parent to adopt from China. However, if they are interested in adopting a child who is deaf or perhaps has microtia, which is a deformity of the ear, then they would permit that parent to adopt based on other circumstances as well. But anyway, I don't want you to feel that if, for example, you do have a history of cancer or some other type of um, physical uh, disability that you cannot adopt. That's not necessarily true. But again, talk to us first about these issues. And we can help you find the, the right uh, opportunity for you to adopt. Mm -hmm. Right. So if China may not be the country for you, we can look at other countries or perhaps domestic adoption or embryo adoption. Um, anyway, here is um, just an example of a letter for you just to see what the kind of, again, this would be a supporting document in your home study. The other area that we also address in the home study is your marriage. And we ask questions like, how did you meet? What attracted you to each other? What was your dating relationship like? Again, this is a way to present yourself and let us know a little bit more about you, what makes your marriage strong. This is a great opportunity to complement each other. And then also everybody has disagreements, and it's not whether or not you do, but how you handle those disagreements. For your marriage, we need to have a certified copy of your marriage certificate. Um, some people have, were married out of the country, and so they need to uh, access their certificate. Um, if you were divorced or widowed, you need to have a certified copy of the divorce or death certificate as well. And as I said before, this is a home study. So every home study includes a visit to your home. Now, you may meet actually in the office as well. But, of course, we do have to come physically see where the child will reside, and we will visit the whole home. We don't look under beds. We don't look in closets. Um, we may pass through your garage. It doesn't have to be a spick and span garage or anything like that. And in fact, right here I'm showing you apartments. You don't even necessarily have to live physically in a home. You you can live in an apartment. Again, based on the country from which you're adopting, they may have certain restrictions regarding the type of home that you live in. But overall, uh, it, it does not matter. Don't worry about what we're going to be looking at in your home. We do not come through with a white glove test. Uh, I have three kids at home and two dogs and a cat. And so um, I understand what it's like, like to, to live in a house. <laughs> and do not expect your kitchen to look like this. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Then there's some special considerations in many homes. As Rhonda was saying, she has a dog and a cat, or a couple of dogs and cats. And we want to make sure that they are vaccinated as required by law that we just need to go ahead and see that. And usually you could just have that faxed over from the veterinarian uh, to our office. Sometimes folks have swimming pools. We want to make sure that there's a gate around the swimming pool, that it's locked, that certain precautions are taken. Uh, so in certain states, you're not allowed to have guns in your home, or if you do, they must be locked up, for example, something that we would ask. Issues related to smoke alarms, um, fire extinguishers, just, to, just basically safety precautions within your home is what we're looking at. Well, we also want to look at also the resources that you have near your home. 
such as recreational, educational, medical. Most families who live in our area, for example, if you're having a home study done in Southern California or in South Carolina, you're always going to live close enough to some type of a facility. For example, if you adopt a child with special needs or special educational needs or someone needing a child needing physical therapy, speech therapy, we want to know that you'll be able to uh, provide these to the child. And in almost all instances, you can. It should never really be an issue if you live within a certain radius of a city. Do you want to tell us about motivating to adopt and your readiness to adopt, Rhonda? Sure. Um, when we're looking at what your motivation is, we want to make sure that you want to complete your family with a child, that you're not deciding to adopt just to make the world a better place. Because unfortunately, although that, that's a um, wonderful, wonderful thing, it uh, doesn't help a child that much. Children need to understand that the family is going to be there no matter what. And then the readiness to adopt, can you want to? Okay. We're looking at, are you ready to bring a child into your home? Have you resolved any issues that you had from your past? Um, what kind of support system do you have in place? Um, we we want to make sure that if you are struggling with your child, that you have a family member or close friend that's nearby that you can call to uh, come over and be a support to you. We want to see, are, are your family members supportive of this adoption? Are they going to stand behind you and help you out as needed? Mm -hmm. And sometimes when families are looking to adopt, sometimes it's because of infertility. And we really do ask that you have finished your infertility treatment, that you are looking to adopt. And as much as you can in resolving those issues related to infertility, and, and being honest about it and saying, yes, you know, we've, we've grieved that loss and then we've moved on. And as, as Rhonda has said, you know, sometimes these children, particularly the children who come from overseas and they're a little bit older, they are going to have special issues. And we want to make sure that you're not doing it alone, that you do have a support system in place and that your family members are supportive. And sometimes even adopting transracially, you may feel that you don't have the necessarily the support of every last relative, and that's not what we're asking. But overall, that your family's going to be there or friends or a church group or someone is going to be there for you to, um, to help you along. And we also ask what have you experienced, not everyone obviously is a parent who's adopting, so we want to know uh, what it's preparing you for adopting a child. Have you ever had someone come live in your home? Have you ever had faced a crisis and how did you handle that? And what are your expectations? Sometimes when families are adopting a child, they just think this is they've waited so long and now this child, this beautiful child, they have this loving picture and the child's smiling and happy that it's, the child is just going to just adjust very easily. And we have found that adoptions that are most successful are those in which the parents have had realistic expectations. Your child may need to go to physical therapy and speech therapy. Your child may not be able to do everything that other three-year-olds are able to do. So we just want to make sure that you're comfortable with the situation and that you've been disappointed sometimes in life and then seeing how you've faced that. Because there will be disappointments. There will be lots of joys, but there will be disappointments. And you want to talk about children? If you have children, we really want to look at what life is like in your family with those children. What kind of parenting style do you have? Uh, how do you discipline your children? How do you show them love? Uh, we will be talking to your children to see how they're feeling about the upcoming adoption and what life is like for them in your family. Um, if you don't have children, we're going to be talking to you about experiences you've had with children, children that you've babysat, friends' uh, children, um, your nieces, nephews. We want to see what your relationship is with them and whether you've spent any length of time with them. Um, because that gives us an idea of what your parenting style will be, even though you haven't parented. Some of you I know are interested in adopting children with special needs. And what we want to look at, of course, and we are required within the home study to write down the, the very specific types of special needs 
that you are open to and adopting with a child. So if you're looking, say, for example, at cleft palate, cleft lip, we need to identify this. Um, your openness to the special needs of the child as well, say, for example, that you may say, okay, we're looking at this type of special needs, but we're also open to a child who may be tuberculosis positive or hepatitis B positive. We want to know how you've educated yourself regarding the child's special needs, what kind of research, have you talked to any doctors, and any kind of experience that you may have. Now, again, you may not necessarily have experience with a specific special need, but if you do, we certainly want to talk about that and put that into your home study. Again, our, our desire is to enhance you and also, obviously, to make sure that you do feel prepared. Again, that goes back to that 70% that Rhonda mentioned of education that we want to make sure that you, we can help you along. If we feel like you maybe need more education, again, we want to be a resource for you. It's not that we're saying, oh, you're not educated enough, but we want to give you the tools to become more educated. Okay, we also want to look at your coping skills. What kind of experiences have you had with stress in the past? How have you dealt with it? And look at uh, your crisis management. Where can we help you if you need some help in this area? Um, and how have you dealt with it in the past? We also want to ask, as required in every home study, about your plans for child care, especially if both parents are working, If you are, what kind of time you're planning on taking off of work. And then also, we do encourage you, and it is required for a China home study, that you share about a guardian for your child. So we need to know a little bit of information about that person, such as where they live, basically their overall income, the kind of house that the child would be living in in the event of your demise. Rhonda, I know you feel really strongly about this. <laughs> you want to add to it? Um, I, I really see where if children have a parent home with them, the first year, it makes such a difference in terms of their ability to form a strong and lasting attachment. Um, I've studied attachment and worked in the field for over 20 years. And when I see, I can literally pick out in a room of children who went to daycare and who had a stay-at-home mom. It really makes a difference. Um, even with homegrown children. And so when we see kids that are adopted from another country or adopted at an older age, having that parent at home it really makes the critical foundation of family much stronger with the child and really allows the child to, to build a strong attachment to their family. I, I think I also wanted to mention with a guardian, with any international home study, uh, as far as I know, all the countries we work with do require information about a guardian. Mm -hmm. One other thing I would like to add also that Rhonda feels strongly about, and I do agree with her, and I know this isn't possible for every family, but when you are adopting an older child, a school-aged child, we highly, highly recommend mm -hmm. that you initially plan to homeschool the child to some capacity because it's so difficult for a child to come from one country to the other and make a transition. And if the child is adopted during the school year, then to put that child immediately into school is just so overwhelming for a child. In addition to well, that, go ahead. Well, excuse me, Laura, I just wanted to add with that, that what happens is if the child come, goes right directly into school after coming from another country where they don't speak any English, it really affects their long-term adjustment in that they always are looked at as the foreigner. Whereas if they have a good solid year of homeschooling, by the time they go to school, they're speaking English pretty fluently and are very comfortable and they're going to understand what's going on in their environment. Certainly, children could go to school right away, and some children are really wanting that. But we really have found that with older children, they do benefit by having at least a semester at home where they can start to, to really acquire English and understand what's going on in their environment. And Rhonda, you bring up a really good point about the the language and being identified, quote-unquote, as the foreigner. And as we all know, 
that in other countries people have little ways of doing things, their body language, their little nuances. And again, especially a child who's coming from an orphanage situation, they they don't necessarily know how to act and how to respond with other children, the little, even the American nuances that we would have. And so if a child is home for a while, the child can learn these sort of patterns by being around other children in a much more safe environment than in a school environment. School could be harsh enough for children, and then you take someone who doesn't speak the language and then someone who doesn't understand the culture. You could see where it could be very difficult. And the whole idea, again, as Rhonda was saying too, is the whole attachment with you. And so we want the child to be attaching with you, not to be gone from you for eight hours a day. So, again, it's something to consider uh, it's in an ideal situation. We know that not every family can do that, but we certainly, if you want to make your adoption as successful as possible, these are the, this is what we're telling you that you could do and want to maybe consider doing to make it as positive as possible. All right, you want to talk about the crimes, Rhonda? <laughs> sure. Um, well, you know, I think this is something that really concerns a lot of people when they begin a home study because it's not unusual for someone as a teenager uh, or young adult to do some things that they might be embarrassed about uh, as um, as they're in their, you know, actually an adult and looking at uh, adopting a child. Uh, because you did something um, as a young adult, you will need to reveal it to us, even if you were told that, that it had been expunged from your records. Because... Adoption gets a very fine screen and um, with your fingerprints. And so we do hear about all those things that you thought were expunged. And so you really need to be upfront and honest with your social worker because your social worker knows how to address it and can determine whether this is an issue that you really can proceed on. Um, and in most cases it is. Um, but there have been instances where uh, a family has believed, uh, a pre-adoptive parent has believed that an issue was expunged, did not reveal it. And I will tell you that it's not fun for both uh, the pre-adoptive parents as well as the social worker to receive what I call the nasty gram from the FBI stating that, uh, you know, there were issues that were not revealed in the home study. Um, it can cause you to not be able to proceed with your home study if you have not been upfront and truthful with your social worker. This is really an important issue and you, you need to disclose anything um, in your past. Uh, if you have been a victim of child uh, abuse, that would not prevent you from adopting, but if you were a perpetrator of child abuse, you would be prevented from adopting. And um, we do need to check sex offender registries, and um, again, if you are on one, that, w that too would prevent you from adopting. And as Rhonda was saying, just to kind of let you know that really when we do the criminal clearances, we do a state law enforcement in generally, and also one by the FBI. And you may actually have to have it done twice. For example, if the country from which you are adopting is requiring an FBI clearance, you have to have one done at, your, at the state level for them, and then also when you will have to go to immigration as well to have FBI clearance. And we never get the results of your FBI clearance through immigration because, as Rhonda was explaining, even if you have an expunged record or you thought somehow it never got to the FBI, it's, it's most likely there, and they, they do reveal it. There is a, a certain level that they can go deeper, and you really do need to reveal what may be in there to us, and we can work with you from there. Uh, and as she said, no matter how minor, it needs to be addressed, And even if you think it's been pardoned. And some countries will not permit anyone who has a criminal record to adopt. Again, talk to us about this before you start. We don't want you investing a lot into a program and looking forward to it if we feel that it is a crime, even though maybe it's many, many years ago and the country is still saying no. Again, we can find another program for you. And then some countries are more flexible, and usually it's the nature and when and how and, and the circumstances. We will work with you with that, but please be up front with us. Again, if you call us beforehand and let us know. Uh, some of the questions that will be asked in the home study that we absolutely have to ask you 
safety regarding this and anyone 18 or over. And by the way, it gets a little comical almost sometimes asking someone who's 18 or older in your household these questions. For example, if you have an 18-year-old, we ask, have you ever been arrested? Have you ever had an unfavorable home study evaluation? Um, have you ever had a record for substance abuse, in other words, a criminal history and, or an unfavorable history of alcohol abuse? And again, talk to us about this. We can get letters of reference. We can talk depending upon when it was. If you have, if you just recovered from alcohol six months ago, obviously that's going to be an issue. If it was 20 years ago, again, we could work with you. Obviously, if you have a history of sexual abuse, that makes it very difficult. Or if you have a history of actually, as Rhonda said, abusing a child. Uh, but again, we sometimes have families, obviously, who have a history that they were abused or a history of domestic violence. And again, talk to us about it ahead, and we will um, we will advise you accordingly. You want to talk about people who have With, been Sure. sure. Um, we really um, have to ask questions about abuse, and we understand that it's very difficult to reveal some of these issues to a social worker that you may not know very well. But it is important because we need to ensure that if you've endured physical or sexual abuse, that you've resolved the issues uh, behind that and that you are ready to move on to adopt. Because what we've actually seen is families that have issues tend to end up with children who have similar issues. We want to make sure that you can really be there for your child and help them through the issues that they have had. Um, we understand that being a victim of abuse is not your fault, but we also want to see how you've dealt with it, and um, we want to get an idea of how you will deal with it with your child. Uh, in most circumstances, you're going to be approved by a home study agency along with your placing agency, immigration, and any other state and federal organizations. So there are a lot of organizations that are reviewing your home study and determining whether you are, in fact, ready to adopt. And so we want to make sure that you've really resolved these issues and you are ready to move forward. Then there are also the psychological issues that we also address, such as we talked about this before, your coping issues, how you've been able to cope. Not that you haven't had problems, but how have you coped with them? Have you had any counseling? Again, we see that as being very positive, whether someone's been into counseling, again, especially if they've come from a difficult background. And then the use of psychotropic drugs, um, particularly certain countries such as China, they are particularly asked this, Korea asked this, and they want to know if you, if you are using psychotropic drugs. And again, being honest with us, again, if it's, if it's a program that you don't qualify for, then we can look somewhere else where you can. We understand that some families, uh, for whatever reason, maybe do take some mild form of a psychotropic drug. But we want to, again, if for you to go ahead and let us know this so that, again, we're, we don't steer you in the wrong direction as far as adopting. We don't want you to, again, start a program that you may not be able to complete. We look at um, your history of drug or alcohol abuse. If there is any any abuse in your history, you must disclose. You have a duty to disclose. So um, if you had a problem with alcohol or drugs as a teenager but resolved it and have been clean and have participated in programs to ensure that you, you no longer um, have a problem, AA, NA, um, that's what we like to see. We do ask for evidence from a treatment counselor, um, and we need a letter from you verifying that you're no longer addicted to drugs and alcohol and that you're doing well. We may ask for additional information, again, a support that you really are ready to move forward on an adoption. We might ask you why you entered treatment, what type of treatment you had, and what kind of treatment plan you've had for the future to maintain uh, your current lifestyle. Uh, again, we don't want to dwell too much when someone has a history that is uncertain, but obviously we wouldn't spend this kind of time if there were not so many people who do come to us that have had difficult paths, especially families who are a little bit older. The longer you've lived, the more opportunity that you've had to kind of look at life and kind of evaluate it, and we all know that people don't come from perfect families. And so we may ask you for extra letters of reference. 
just to verify. We may ask you to take a psychological test. Or 20 years ago you suffered from depression and maybe were hospitalized for that. We may ask you to do that. Again, it's how we're presenting you in the best possible light. We may ask a letter from your counselor. And then maybe finding out what kind of leadership roles and other kinds of work and volunteer work and other ways that you show that you are a healthy person and that you are different in certain ways from maybe um, a past that may have been not as positive as you would like for it to be. And as we mentioned before, we will ask you about your home study history. Did you want to comment on that, Rhonda? Uh, yes. Um, certainly, if you've had a home study done before, if you have other adoptive children in your home, we understand you've had a home study before. But this, again, is part of the duty to disclose. We need to understand if perhaps you started a home study before and didn't complete it. We'd want to know why you didn't complete it, or if you had a a uh, home study that was turned down? What was going on in your life that caused that home study to be turned down? So we want to find out more of your home study history. And again, this is required particularly by immigration, and we ask about it in every home study. We also want to look at your financial stability. Um, adoptions are just plain expensive, uh, fifteen to thirty thousand dollars. Yes, there's ways, like for example, with a tax credit refund, that a lot of it could be returned. But we're not just looking to say, can you afford an adoption? But also, can you afford a child? And I understand families who are maybe don't make as much money that they can afford to raise a child, but coming up with thirty thousand or whatever is is quite a bit of money. And we know that families get grants, and their church helps them, and people help them out, and so forth. And, and we that's fine, but the overall, every country and certainly immigration and social services that our home studies in South Carolina go through and the courts want to see is can you afford a child? And at the end of the month, do you have more left over? And then also just even looking at your overall assets and liabilities, uh, basically are you in the plus column? We want you to show that you really can afford to be able to send your child to um, counseling if they need it, or if they have a uh, a great skill in dancing or in soccer, that they can participate in those activities. Um, we want to make sure that you are able to provide for the needs of the child you're adopting. And that's a really good point, Rhonda, about the counseling and the other services. And although there are benefits that you can get through different, say, early intervention programs in our state through TEFRA, it's called, um, even sometimes Medicaid for certain children, overall we want to know that if your child needs some counseling or something else that you're going to be able to, even if it's a copay, that you're going to be able to go ahead and afford that. Because sometimes children do need these extra helps and services. Okay, we ask that you get references from at least three different uh, friends or couples that uh, have known you for quite a while. And that way we can hear from other people why they think you would be an amazing parent. Um, we do ask that you also include a letter from a family member to see what their perception of you has been growing up as well as uh, now that you are ready to be a parent. We look at the, ref the reference letter includes the person's name, address, phone number, and email address. It explains how long they've known you in what capacity and why they think you would make a great parent. It's a nice, warm, personal letter. 99.9% .9 obviously are all very positive about you. And certainly you can add in extra. You, do, you don't have to limit yourself to three reference letters, but that's a starting point. As I had mentioned before, when we do ask questions, say, about your criminal history or if you've ever had a home study done before, et cetera, we have to ask those types of questions to other adult members in the household as well. And sometimes grandma and grandpa live there or an uncle or just a friend or whatever for whatever reason. But whoever else is in the home, that person also has to be assessed as well as adult children who live in the home. 
such as your 18 or 19 year old child? There are many issues in regard to adoption, and one of the things we really look at is loss and grief. Certainly, every person has had some experience of loss and grief in their own life lifetime, and when we bring a child into your home, that child too has experienced loss and grief as they have had to um, as they have lost the orphanage uh, caregivers that were caring for them or the foster care family. Um, so, so there are issues that start even when you first adopt, but also lifelong. Uh, particularly in adolescence, we will see children that will start talking about uh, the loss of their biological family and what that means to them and also what it as they look towards their future. Um, it's important to talk about adoption from the moment you adopt your child. I had a call from a family the other day who had adopted their child at birth, and the child was seven years old, and they said, when should we start talking about adoption? And my, my response was seven years ago. Because if you are talking to your, your child about adoption from the very beginning, it never becomes the big issue. Whereas if it's something that you hold off on and you keep as a secret, it will come back and haunt you. And it will make it more difficult for your child to trust you once they do find out that they were adopted. If it's an ongoing conversation, very open, and an everyday thing, it does not become an issue. Um, and I think, you know, certainly there are things that come up throughout a, a the lifetime of a person, um, and I think it's just being aware of it and being open to talking about issues that are related to adoption. Families that are open to it tend to have a much easier time. When it's a secret, it tends to um, have a much greater impact and um, become a more difficult issue to deal with. And along with talking to your child and being able to discuss adoption issues is your attitude toward the birth family. And this kind of goes hand in hand when you do talk to your child, the issue of whose tummy did I grow in and where did I come from and how you feel about the birth family. This isn't just for families who are adopting domestically. These are even for families who are adopting overseas who may never even be able to identify who the birth mother and birth father are, such as from China. But the fact that somebody cared about your child, somebody cared to place your child for adoption, and that you're willing to openly discuss who this person is. And for some children who are adopted internationally, sometimes it's actually more information because the records are very complete as to who the birth mother in particular is and the possibility of someday even finding her. So when you talk to your child, it inevitably it is going to come up, who, who is my birth family? And then your child someday may want to actually uh, find out or keep in contact. Again, if it's a domestic adoption, it's a whole lot easier to stay in contact. And we also have a webinar related to talking to your child about adoption that addresses the issue of even involving the birth family in your child's life. You know, counseling for children uh, is not, it can seem pretty scary. But what we find is that it can be very beneficial. Um, and children that are struggling, getting a counselor involved and getting some therapy can be really helpful in terms of the child resolving issues that are uh, bothering that child. Um, certainly, children come to you with adoption often with an unknown genetic or prenatal background. And so there are some things that, that the, the child may have experienced um, before they were adopted that that can come through in therapy and help the child to resolve these issues. And sometimes for children, particularly when they're adopted very young, and say, for example, they were the mother was under a lot of stress prenatally or they had a obviously less than ideal situation in the orphanage, they don't even have those memories, so they can't even talk about it. And that's even harder in some ways than the child who can remember and then at least verbalize what really happened. And again, sometimes counseling can really 
help. And it's not just necessarily counseling for the child, but children also know how to press your buttons. So if you have an issue that's kind of related to your background, and you may not even have realized it, but your child will come into your home and realize it, and they will know how to um, stir up what's not been maybe stirred up in you before. And so counseling can be really good for the whole family. It isn't just about the child. I've seen this, and I've seen families grow uh, through the counseling experience. And the support experience, too, with other families and being able to talk about the issues that they are facing. So when we look at the completion of the home study, the last section is called the recommendation. And that's where we're talking about what kind of child we feel that you are prepared to adopt. We're looking at the number of the ch children, uh, the gender, and the ages. Uh, we, we're looking at, are you prepared to adopt a child that might have special needs? And if so, what special needs would you be prepared to adopt? Would you be okay with a child who had um, strabismus or uh, a minor correctable heart condition? These are all things that we want to look at. Thanks. And let me just say under recommendation another thought, too, is I know we've said a lot of issues that can be a concern, and certainly we want you to be prepared. And you may be feeling, I will never pass a home study with nightlight. But people who come to us, first of all, are people who are usually very interested in children, very loving, very kind. And we really want to work with you. Most, most families pass a home study. Again, a, a country may have certain restrictions, such as a weight restriction with China or Korea. You know, if you weigh a certain amount, you just can't adopt from China, period. Um, again, talk to us about it. Sometimes it, they, they're a little flexible. If you're, not, if you're 25 years old, you can't adopt from China. Nothing you could do about that. But we can talk to you about other programs. It's not necessarily that something is wrong while you may not qualify from a specific program. But if you do feel like there is some difficulty in your background, most of the time it does not keep someone from adopting. There are, again, very, very few families who do not qualify. So I want to leave on a really positive note with you. There is strength in, in weakness. There can be issues that you have faced that make you a better person, and that's what we want to bring out with you in the home study. So. We are, want to let you know that we are here to help you. Please feel free to contact us, to, to contact Rhonda in the California office. It's just Rhonda at nightlight.org. Uh, Aaron, and Aaron J, it could also be at Nightlight, Aaron Je Jenkins at Nightlight. She's in the South Carolina office, and she coordinates the home study services. She's a social worker. And you can contact me at Laura at Nightlight. Uh, thank you very much, and we hope to be hearing from you. Thank you.